Hi, I'm Mark Dulski from Waterson Kettering, and I'm just going to go through uh, the GNOME's pathway to determine a really uh, an organized way of looking at uh, spine tumors, how to make really effective decisions that are consistent across institutions, and hopefully this will be helpful for you. This is a typical case example of a 66-year-old male with a history of renal cell carcinoma. It has a three-week history of what we call biologic back pain, which is night or morning pain that, uh, that resolves over the course of the day as the patient gets up and walks. Uh, it does not denote instability, which is usually axial load uh, 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 pain. It's a acute onset of weakness, Asia C, less than three out of five in extremities. He has other medical issues with chronic renal insufficiency and a creatinine 2.5. Systemic workup showed other disease with renal cell extending in the renal veins and pulmonary nodules. And you can see this really high-grade circumferential disease at T10. This patient is really complicated. It has a lot of issues going on. He has severe back pain, his neurologic issues, and then he has uh, some medical issues that really come into play in terms of making decisions about patient care. The GNOMES framework was really developed to define the four sentinel decision points that you need to make in every patient to determine best therapy. The four sentinel decision points are neurologic, oncologic, mechanical stability, and systemic disease to decide best treatment. This is really a living, vibrant framework, and it has changed approximately every two years as we integrate new technologies uh, and evidence-based medicine. But essentially, those four sentinel decision points remain the same. In terms of the NOMS framework, the neurologic and oncologic considerations are made in combination. From a neurologic perspective, we're very concerned about whether the patient has myelopathy or a functional radiculopathy, but much of the decision-making is based on the degree of epidural spinal cord compression. There's a scoring system that's been validated where zero is bone only, one A, B, and C are different degrees of epidural impingement without spinal cord compression. Grade two is spinal cord compression, but CSF is seen, and three is spinal cord compression, no CSF seen. And at least currently, the twos and threes are considered to be high-grade cord compression for decision-making purposes. From an oncologic perspective, what we're really talking about is how we achieve local tumor control, which is completely predicated on radiation sensitivity. Radiation sensitivity has been completely redefined as we've transitioned from conventional external beam radiation to high-dose hypofractionated stereotactic radiosurgery. Mechanical instability is a separate assessment as no amount of radiation will stabilize an unstable spine. The SINS criteria was developed to define instability in the neoplastic setting. Uh, uh, the SINS criteria seen on the right has six components. The most important component is really pain. It's that axial load or movement-related pain that denotes fracture-related uh, pain versus that biologic pain, the night or morning pain, which really denotes uh, simply tumor being there. And it's very important to differentiate that. The rest of SINs is really radiographic correlates for that pain. Location, junctional, mobile spine have a higher point score than semi-rigid or rigid spine. The bone lytic disease has a higher point score than mixed or blastic disease. Alignment, subluxation, translation has the highest point score. The degree of arterial body collapse or involvement and whether the posterior elements are involved bilateral, unilateral, or none. These components are weighted by their contribution to instability. Zero to six is stable. Seven to 12, potentially unstable and greater than 13, unstable. Uh, for much of our uh, patient population, we're really dealing with burst or compression fractures that fall into that potentially unstable category. Uh, Kyphor vertebroplasty, percutaneous cement augmentation of thoracic and lumbar spine is very effective for treating these patients and getting out, out of pain in a very short period of time. There is class one evidence in the CAFE study uh, that patients who undergo kyphoplasty compared to best medical management have significantly better pain relief, both in a month and durable out to a year. It turns out if you have a burst or compression fracture with extension into the posterior elements, you can't do standalone kyphoplasty. You have to back them up with a posterior tension band. We most often do this with percutaneous pedicle screws that are cement augmented with kyphoplasty at the index level. And again, have significantly good pain outcomes using this strategy. And finally, there are patients like the one at the bottom who has a significant fracture subluxation at C12 who needs occipital cervical fixation as an open procedure. The final assessment is, does any treatment make sense in the context of the patient's disease? Are they too sick? Do they have too many medical comorbidities to undergo surgery or potentially even radiation therapy? Uh, it turns out that in the era of biology and checkpoint inhibitors, we have extended survivals for every single tumor histology compared to standard chemotherapy. Here for melanoma, we have more than triple the survival using a single checkpoint inhibitor, nivolumab, compared to, uh, compared to conventional chemotherapy. And there's essentially a new 
biologic or checkpoint inhibitor that comes out uh, for every tumor virtually on a monthly basis. And so our survival uh, trends have uh, changed dramatically. Using the standard uh, uh, predictive nomograms that we've had in the past, such as the Tamita and Takahashi score, were really developed before we had these better agents. But there are uh, nomograms or, or predictive models that have been developed in the Arab biologic checkpoint inhibitors, including the SORG nomogram and the New England metastatic spine score, both of which are available online and very easy uh, to put uh, numbers into and get a, a relatively accurate prediction of whether that patient will be a short-term survival less than 30 days uh, versus extended over a year. And these are very useful, uh, especially in uh, deciding whether you should take somebody to surgery, whether it's meaningful for them in the context of where they are in their disease. In terms of tolerating surgery, frail the indices are being developed specifically for cancer spine patients. Most of them, you look at both sarcopenia and adipose uh, tissue. Uh, and again, these have not been validated yet, but are very useful in deciding whether a patient can tolerate the proposed uh, surgery. Uh, finally, the, uh, cancer patients are different from the general population of degenerative and even trauma patients. Uh, we typically get screening Dopplers, and the rationale for that is that 25% of patients who are non-ambulatory have an occult DVT. Those patients get a filter preoperatively and then full-dose anticoagulation at two to three weeks after surgery. You may not be able to get them in the uh, immediate uh, preoperative period, especially in the emergent situation, but sometimes during the hospitalization, it's not unreasonable to get uh, Dopplers to make sure that you're not going to have a catastrophic uh, pulmonary embolism from an undetected DVT. Uh, to go back to the neurologic and oncologic considerations, again, from an oncologic perspective, what we're talking about is how we achieve local tumor control and to conventional external beam radiation, which is usually 30 gray in 10 fractions, there are sensitive and mildly sensitive tumors, such as hematologic malignancies, myeloma lymphoma, and then the hormone-driven solid tumor malignancies, breast and prostate. Uh, the remainder of the solid tumors are largely radioresistant, colon, non-small cell, thyroid, renal, most of the sarcomas, and melanoma. And then again, from a, a neurologic perspective, a lot of our decision-making is based on the degree of epidural spinal cord compression. Currently, this decision is made that the sensitive and moderately sensitive tumors, regardless of the degree of spinal cord compression, can be put on high-dose steroids and given conventional external beam radiation with the expectation that the tumor will be well-controlled and they won't progress to neurologic symptoms. For moderately to highly resistant tumors with bone only or epidural impingement, we've seen very poor responses to conventional external beam radiation so these patients typically go to stereotactic radiosurgery, 24 gray single fraction, or 24 to 30 gray in three fractions. And then for patients with moderately to highly resistant tumor with high-grade cord compression, we can't conform the beams tightly enough to spare spinal cord tolerance. So these patients will typically go for separation surgery followed by stereotactic radiosurgery to get local tumor control. If we add myelopathy to the mix, the only patients we really treat with conventional external beam radiation in the setting of high-grade cord compression with myelopathy are the exquisitely sensitive hematologic malignancies, myeloma, lymphoma. It turns out that breast and prostate, you can't decompress the spinal cord quickly enough in the setting of myelopathy. So essentially all solid tumor malignancies uh, uh, with high-grade compression and myelopathy will go for separation surgery followed by radiosurgery. And in the unknown uh, primary comes into your uh, emergency room with no history of cancer and you do not know the tumor histology, uh, the, the default in the patient with high-grade cord compression myelopathy is simply take them to surgery, A, because it's very difficult to establish a definitive diagnosis in a timely manner, and two, often there's a very small window between them uh, coming in with some degree of myelopathy and then acutely decompensating. So our recommendation is if it's unknown high-grade cord compression and the patient can tolerate from a medical standpoint, take them to surgery, get them out of trouble, and then get them to effective therapy afterwards. What do we know about radiosensitivity, conventional external beam radiation? Well, there's very little in the literature that looked at differential radiosensitivity based on tumor histology, but what's there was remarkably consistent. Again, there are these radiosensitive tumors to 30 gray and 10 fractions, such as lymphoma, myeloma, and then the hormone-driven solid tumor malignancies, breast and prostate, versus the remainder of the tumors are radioresistant. The radiosensitive tumors have two low control rates of 86%. Radioresistant tumors fall to two low control rates of 30%, but the median durable responses in many of these tumor histologies is only three months. This is a patient with multiple myeloma with very high grade cord compression and myelopathy, uh, T10 to 12. 
patient got 30 grain, 10 fractions on high dose steroids. And at 10 days, you can see the tumor completely apoptosed, decompressing the spinal cord. And you cannot do better than this with surgeries. For these patients, uh, even though they have high grade cord compression and myelopathy, we will often treat them with radiation therapy. The problem is you will never see these responses in the radio resistant tumors. So for patients with minimal or no spinal cord compression with radio resistant tumors, we will typically take them straight to stereotactic radio surgery. There is a plethora of data on good outcomes using radio surgery. This is our series of a little over 800 tumors, mostly looking at radio resistant tumor histologies uh, with ESCC scores from bone only to epidural impingement. There were two dose strategies. Uh, the low dose cohort got 16.4 gray single fraction versus the high dose group, 22.4 gray. And the low dose cohort the incidence of local failure was still extremely low at 5%. And in the high-dose cohort, it fell to less than 1%. The problem in the low-dose cohort is they live long enough, you start to see failures at four years, 20% versus the high-dose cohort at 22.4 gray. We had 2.1% failure rate. We're essentially giving an ablative dose of radiation that is completely histology independent as opposed to what we see with conventional external beam radiation. That changed our treatment paradigms. For instance, for this patient with a T10 renal cell metastases, it's solitary. The Tamita Takahashi scores would recommend an on-block resection. And this is an incredibly morbid operation in this patient population. We now can take these patients straight to stereotactic rate of surgery. Treatment times are 20 minutes, no blood loss, and we get 98% durable local tumor control. The problem is that you can't use radio surgery if you have high-grade cord compression because you can't conform the beams tightly enough to spare spinal cord tolerance. So for radio-resistant tumors with high-grade cord compression, we'll typically take those patients to surgery followed by radiation therapy. This is start, still largely predicated on the Patchell study published in 2005. It's a prospective randomized trial of solid tumors looking at high-grade cord compression with myelopathy comparing surgery and conventional external beam to conventional external beam alone. And in every outcome variable, surgery was better than radiation therapy. And based on this and a number of other studies, the Spine Oncology Study Group made a strong recommendation that patients with high-grade spinal cord compression due to solid tumor malignancy undergo surgical decompression and stabilization followed by radiation therapy. The question in 2023 became what kind of surgery and what kind of radiation. When we started to integrate stereotype radio surgery as a post-operative adjuvant, the surgical goals of spinal cord decompression for neurologic salvage and using screw rod systems to provide mechanical stability remain the same. What changed is the oncology, how we achieve local tumor control, again, is completely predicated on the radiation response. So when we use conventional external beam radiation as a post-operative adjuvant, we often did this maximally cytoreductive surgery, the gross total resection around block. With the integration of stereotactic radio surgery, maybe the only goal has to be to reconstitute the fecal sac to create a better target for the radiation. And that became known as separation surgery. Here in this 86 year old papillary thyroid, Asia C, with three level vertebral body disease, the surgery is really very simple. We typically or traditionally have done a fixation, pedicle screw fixation, two levels above and below the index level that requires decompression. Now we go single level above and below with cement augmented screws. You take a high speed drill with a three millimeter matchstick, drill off the lamina, uh, the pedicle and facet joint. You find normal dural margins and strip the tumor off, often using tenotomy scissors or a Woodson dental tool, and then come around anteriorly uh, to take uh, cut the posterior longitudinal ligament across the anterior dura to affect a margin in that plane. Essentially what we're trying to do is not take out all this tumor, but simply reconstitute the fecal sac as shown here to create a better target for the radiation. In this case, the patient got neurologic recovery from an agency uh, and uh, was fully ambulatory two years out. We gave her a surgery that she could tolerate and then we got her to effective radiation to get local tumor control. In terms of separation surgery, 75% of our non-ambulatory patients regained the ability to walk and overall 90% were ambulatory. In terms of patient reported outcomes, patient did significantly well in terms of pain outcomes and general activity. In terms of how we did with local tumor control, if we used aggressive surgery followed by conventional external beam radiation, we still only had 30% control a year. Again, you can't overcome bad biology or radio resistant tumor histology with conventional external beam radiation and maximally cytoreductive surgery. 
When we use this really simple separation surgery followed by radiosurgery here in 186 patients, mostly operated for high-grade port compression with radioresistant tumor histologies and 50% had failed prior radiation. There were three-dose strategies, high-dose single fraction, high-dose hypofractionated, and low-dose hypofractionated. The one-year cumulative of recurrence was 16%, but if we used a high enough dose single or high-dose hypofractionated radiation, we had less uh, than a 10% recurrence of the year. And again, there's no association with radioresistant tumor histology. We overcome radio resistance with high dose per fraction stereotactic radio surgery. So at least in 2023, this is what gnomes look like, although we think it will change again every couple of years as we integrate newer evidence-based medicine and newer technologies. For patients with radio sensitive tumors, regardless of the degree of spinal cord compression, we're very comfortable using conventional external beam radiation. The exception are patients with breast and prostate who are myelopathic those patients require surgical decompression. For radio-resistant tumors with middle or no spinal cord compression, we go straight to stereotactic radiosurgery, often 24-grade single fraction or 8 to 10-grade times 3 fractions. For radio-resistant tumors with high-grade cord compression with or without myelopathy, we'll use this really simple separation surgery followed by radiosurgery. Patients unstable, separate assessment, they need a stabilization procedure, you can do brace application. More often than not, we'll do kyphal vertebral plasty, park screws, or open surgery. And finally, everything is predicated on what the patient can tolerate from a systemic disease standpoint. So we go back to that patient, 66-year-old male with a history of renal cell, with this biologic back pain, night or morning pain that gets better over the course of the day that does not denote instability. Asia C, got other medical issues, chronic renal insufficiency, uh, and uh, extent of disease shows renal cell extending in the renal vein and pulmonary nodules with this very high grade circumferential renal cell at T10. The nose framework patients myelopathic with high grade cord compression. Renal cell is resistant to conventional external beam radiation, which is the only radiation you can use in the setting of high grade cord compression. Mechanical instability doesn't play a role. The SIN score is four and uh, the systemic disease and medical comorbidities. Patient got cleared both by oncology. Uh, and the medical uh, team assessment. In this case, we would put the patient on high-dose steroids. Uh, because renal cell is markedly hypervascular, we would do an embolization procedure. And just as a quick review, there are tumors that benefit from embolization, and the rules of thumb are if the organ of origin is vascular, the tumor probably is too, and if angio or hemangio is anywhere in the name, uh, the tumor is going to be hypervascular. The exception is solitary fibrous tumor, uh, which doesn't really mean much uh, at first glance. The problem is it was uh, the name was changed from hemangioparasitoma. And in our review of hypervascularity, it is the most hypervascular tumor in bone. There are hypervascular tumors that do not benefit from uh, embolization uh, because they don't have major segmental feeders such as myeloma and melanoma. And then most of the solid tumor malignancies are relatively avascular. So we would take this renal cell for an embolization and then do this really simple separation surgery followed by radio surgery to get local tumor control. One of this patient has high-grade cord compression uh, uh, with an Asia C and the tumor histology, instead of being renal cells, lymphoma, which as you know, is exquisitely sensitive to conventional external beam radiation. There are no instability issues uh, in this patient that even in a lymphoma, if they were unstable, you would potentially have to do a procedure to stabilize. In this case, with lymphoma, we put this patient on markedly high-dose steroids and use conventional external beam radiation. My recommendation, though, is bring this patient into the hospital for the initiation of radiation every once in a while. As this tumor apoptosis and creates enormous amount of inflammation, these patients may decompensate, and you need to be there and available if that happens. So even if you're going to use radiation, I would do it in the setting of the hospital. And again, for that patient who has myelopathy uh, with high-grade cord compression in an unknown tumor histology, patient has no history of cancer and you have no idea what this tumor is, default to it being radioresistant, get them out of trouble with separation surgery, and then get them to effective therapy afterwards. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope this helps sort of organize your thinking around this really complicated patient population.